morning, and thank you for coming today. Today is the workshop for the electrical class, and I'm going to introduce myself. John Merrick, Director of Facilities. I'm a retired director from Hop Hog. I worked at Hop Hog for about 20 years. I went to Lindenhurst for six and a half years. I retired from Lindenhurst. I went to East Rockaway as an interim for four months, after, right after I retired because of a, a death there had occurred while they were trying to put on somebody new. I retired for a year. Herrick School District, New Hyde Park area, called me. They needed to bridge the gap for somebody who was coming on from another school district. I bridged the gap there. Retired for another year into Cold Spring Harbor. Unfortunately, the events at Cold Spring Harbor brought me to a directorship again, and I'm just at the tail end of that now. So I retired in 2016, but I'm still doing this. And um, I always volunteer to do the class, teach the electrical class for the uh, association, New York State School Facilities Association, Suffolk County chapter, which I've been a member of for many years. Past president, Glenn has been a member, and uh, that's, that's the long and the short of this, and that's why you're here today. Electrical and electrical concepts. We're going to go over some testing devices in a meter. And I have uh, also a homemade testing device. We're going to, I'm going to show you how to use that. It's easy to make. We're going to go over troubleshooting. We're going to go over lockout tag out, which we're going to do right away, and then working safely with electricity. I'm going to show you some of the do's and don'ts about electricity. And we'll get into that. First thing we should do, though, and that we mentioned lockout tag out, is lockout tag out. This is a lockout tag out kit. Okay. You can buy this, commercially available. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Are you familiar with lockout tagout? I'm familiar. No, I've heard about it. This is uh, required. When you're doing electrical work, you're required to know about lockout tagout. This is uh, also a lockout tagout. This happens to be mine. This, the date on this is 6790. That's how long ago I was using that. Okay. You put your tag on here, and then you put a padlock here. And you only have the key. Okay, so now you can't operate this device because this lock is on it until you take your padlock off. Usually you put a sign on it that says why you locked it out, and you do not operate, and you're the only one that can take this padlock off. If you cut it off with a pair of bolt cutters, you're violating the lockout tagout rules. Lockout tagout is for your protection, or anybody else is protecting. If you go home, somebody else comes up to this machine or device or light or whatever. It's locked out and tagged out for electrical safety. It's important that you at least understand this. Your district should, and I'm sure they do, have lockout tagout equipment. It doesn't have to be this complicated. Lockout tagout can be not only for electrical energy, it can be for steam, water, air pressure, uh, a tunnel. You can lock out a hatch to a tunnel so nobody goes down. You can put Multiple locks on here so that if there's five people working, five people can lock out. All five of you have to unlock to turn this machine on so that all five of you know what the other four people are doing. Okay, any questions on it? So it actually um, goes over the switch. The, uh, it, it, yeah, the it, switch. It, most switches have a hole in them that this will fit in. And once you clip this in, the switch won't move anymore. You know, but again, there are many different devices that you can use. Like I said, this is an expensive kit. You can get them for doorknobs. Don't go into a door. Um, here. This, this one here is handy. You can take a, a plug. Put it in. Lock it here. Now you can't plug this thing in. If you can't, if there's no disconnect on a copier or a typewriter, or anything like that. You can lock it out right like this. I mean, there are lots of different devices in the lockout tagout program. They, they are well designed and they work. Again, you can put this over. They have this is for a ball valve, a ball valve or handle. You put this over the pipe, and the handle can move. They, lots of different things. There's cables in here. This, like I said, is a very complicated kit. It's an expensive kit. It's worth it. And your district should have some sort of lockout tag for you as employees. In case you have to lock something out. And if they don't have it, you should ask them to buy it. And if they don't want to buy it, you should ask them to call me. And I'll be glad to talk to them about it. Uh, I think it's important, and I don't think they'll argue with you. Any other questions about lockout tag? Electricity is the flow of electrical power or energy. Is both a basic part of nature and one of the most widely used forms. Absolutely one of the widely used forms. You show me things that aren't electric today. Everything is electric. 
even the steering on your car is no longer hydraulic, it's electric. No more power steering electric pumps with hydraulic fluid in it, they're electric. Electric has taken over the world for, for the right reasons. It's safe, it's uh, abundant, it's, it's powerful, and it's readily usable. It's part of nature. But it also, you need to understand it so you don't get into trouble. Okay? We are converting energy from one source to another. A car is, the same, is, is a classic example. We are using chemical energy to create it into motion. You're using gasoline, you're converting the gasoline, and you're using and it converts it into motion of the car. Electric is the same way. We're using coal, we're using nuclear energy, we're using uh, natural gas, we're using oil to run generators to get electricity. So we're converting some sort of energy that's always been here. Right? The law of energy says all the energy on the planet has been here and will always be here. We're just converting it to another form, electricity. Uh, electricity is also referred to as an energy carrier, which means you can convert <coughs> other forms of electricity, such as mechanical energy or heat. So electricity is one of these things that you can't see, but you can feel the effects. If a heater is on, you can feel the effect of the electricity with the heat that you feel. That's a conversion, and you, you can't see it, but you can feel it. That's one of the things about electricity that makes it dangerous. It's, you cannot see it. Water pressure you can usually see. You can usually see a waterfall. You can actually see the energy. But in electricity, you can't see the flow of electrons in a wire. If you look at a wire, you can't tell if it's live or not. That's the danger. That's where the danger is. You can't see it. So it's converted into energy or heat, a motor that's turning. There's a conversion from the electricity converts that electricity force into a motor that turns. This, that's the easiest way I can explain mechanical energy uh, and heat. Well, heat, we know it's a toaster. You have a toaster. You can see, you can see the toaster getting hot, the red, but you can't see the electrons flowing. It's, it's a result of the electricity. Okay? Questions? Nothing? You understand that? Okay. Uh, electricity is voltage and current. Current is measured in amperes. To relate that to water, current is like gallons per minute. It's not so much how much pressure there is, but gallons per minute. That's what current is, amperes. Think of it as GPM. Voltage, think of as pressure. So here we can have a lot of pressure, like a, like a pressure washer. Tremendous amount of pressure very small gallons per minute. So, we, so in that electrical example, it would be high voltage, low current. Okay? The other way around would be an electric heater. Low voltage, a lot of current. Coffee pots, electric heaters, motors, they draw a lot of power, but their voltage is usually low. Electrical transmission lines, like the ones you saw in that picture, 345,000 volts, but the current is very low. Because in the conversion, which we'll show you with the, the formulas that I'm going to show you later, when you convert that 345,000 into current, it becomes tremendous. That's why the lines are run at 345,000 volts. They can run far distances with low current, because current is the enemy of transmission. You lose your voltage drop when you try to run electricity over wires for many, many miles. That's what happened to DC. DC couldn't run the distance, AC can run distances. DC couldn't, and that's why DC f fell out of favor. AC picked up the war. Uh, if you ever saw the movie, War of the Currents, Westinghouse and Edison, Edison was a DC guy, Westinghouse was an AC guy. AC won. Watch the movie, it's a great movie. Current is often being described as DC or alternating AC. These terms are how the current varies in time. AC, I'll show you on the board over here. You've probably seen this in high school. Tell me you haven't. AC is that sine wave. That's AC. DC is those square waves. Plus and minus. AC, DC. So the AC is varying from high to low to high 60 times a second. Okay? 60 cycles a second. You know what that, that means? That's what it means. 60 cycles a second. That's AC. DC is straight waves, box waves. I'm only showing you that for illustration purposes to give you an idea of the difference between AC and DC. 
So why do we use DC? DC is handy because it's uh, easy to manage. In flashlights, it, 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 it's, AC is a little more tough to manage in small little loads. So DC works good in batteries and phones, uh, even trains. Trains run on DC. Long uh, railroad, that's DC. That's 400 volts DC. Tremendous amount of current. Look at the wires on those tracks. They're like this. But it's DC because they can slow the trains down. They can vary the voltage very easily with DC rather than AC. A little more complicated, but that's, that's the idea. Uh, reverses the, AC reverses the direction repeatedly down on a, on a sine wave. Yeah, and I know you learned this in high school. I know you did because I was there. I wasn't paying attention. Now I had to relearn it. Uh, voltage is the rate at which electricity is transferred by electrical circuit. The unit of power is a watt, or one joule per second. Watts is what you pay for. You don't pay for voltage, you pay for wattage. Wattage is where the heat is. Wattage is where all the money is. Like mechanical power is the rate of doing work measuring in watts. I'll give me an example of watts. Go back to the board here. Something that you guys in schools, well, maybe not in BOCES, but in schools have a big understanding. We have a football field. We have four poles on it. Right? 58,000 watts. 58,000 watts. That's what usually they run. Okay? Here's what happens. You call up PSC and G, you say, I'm going to build a football field, I need 58,000 watts. They say, holy mackerel. They call up the power station and say, increase by 58,000 watts. And you have a football game, it's only four hours. Well, they just added on to their power plant to give you 58,000 watts, you didn't turn it on. So here's what happens. They have demand metering that says, the minute you turn that on, it goes to 58,000, it comes back down four hours later. Okay? You pay for this. This wattage, you're going to pay for it in your bill. It's called demand metering. Because you demand it for such a short period of time, they, give you a, they charge you a premium for that. Wattage is what you pay for. Wattage is what you're paying for at home. When you get your bill in the mail, it's kilowatts. 1,000 1, watts. Kilowatts. You're not paying for the voltage. You're paying for the wattage. So, 58,000 watts on a football field every second that those lights are on. Think about that. It's a lot of money. And it's not at 15 cents a kilowatt either. They charge a premium because of this. You don't, you don't turn it off for a week. Their power plant, they already get it on to the power plant and you didn't turn it on. They're waiting for you to turn it on so that they can charge you. Demand metering. That's how most um, commercial meters are, operate. They operate on demand, not like your home, which you pay for every single kilowatt at the same rate. In demand metering, you pay for that peak. So if you hit 58,000, they'll charge you the 58,000 rate. And it's more per kilowatt. You got it, if you got it down to 30,000, the rate would be less. That's how demand mm -hmm. works. Okay, any questions on that? Watts. Watts is what you're paying for. Watts is where it's at. That's the amperage. That's the current. That's the heat. That's what you're paying for. Okay? The difference between volts and amps. Volts and amps. Okay, let's go back to that uh, water. Water. That, that pressure washer. Pressure washer, 3,000 psi, right? Mm -hmm. But what, a couple gallons of water? So, high voltage, low current. Okay? The toaster, the voltage is much lower, uh, 110, but it's 20 amps. Toasting bread or a microwave or a uh, uh, little uh, toaster oven. Okay, so the difference between voltage and amps is. Amps is how much electricity is going down that wire. Volts is how much it pushes it. Right. But amps is that's where the that's where the money is. Like it's kind of like gallons per minute. Yes. Per amps per is per gallons side. per minute. Amps is gallons per minute. Okay. Think about that pressure washer. Pressure washer is very low current, but high voltage. And the other way around. So if you were trying to, let's say you were trying to fill a swimming pool, would you use a pressure washer or a fire hydrant? Fire hydrant is like this, yeah. okay? So you're getting six, seven hundred gallons a minute. That's how you fill a swimming pool, amperage. You don't care what the pressure is, it could be 10 pounds. As long as you're getting 500 gallons a minute, you're going to fill that pool. You couldn't, it'd take you forever to fill it with a pressure washer, all right? But you'd have 3,000 PSI. You have no gallonage. What does a swimming pool need? It needs gallonage. It needs 20,000 gallons of water. Okay? Yep. You got that? 
amperage. There's a formula for that, correct? That's right. Go, like go, if you use a blow dryer, an 1800 watt blow dryer on 120, that's going to give you the amount of amps that you need to run that. You got it. And we're going to go over that. I don't know much about that. Later on in the program, we're going to gonna do formulas on the board. You're going to be an expert on formulas. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> you're going to learn two formulas today. Okay? Any other questions on that? You clear on that? Yep. Let's see where else we are. Electrical circuits, an interconnection of electrical components that electrical charges make to flow along a closed path of circuit because you can perform some useful task, like lighting a light bulb. It's a closed circuit. Components in electrical take many forms, which can include elements such as resistors, capacitors, switches, transformers, and electronics. Yeah, I have a bunch of stuff here. Switches, we have a receptacle, we have a GFI, which we're going to play with. We have uh, a lamp here, you know, we're going to Get into all of that switching and some circuitry, and we'll draw it out on the board to give you a better idea of what we're talking about. Okay? Concepts. Electrical systems. 120 versus 240. 120 used for residential and handheld devices. 240 is used for larger loads, heating, and machinery. Single phase, commonly used in residential service. Okay, so let's just stay over here for just a minute. 120, 240. That's what you have in your house. Your house is 240 coming in, 120 to the load. Okay? You understand that? We're going to draw it. Let's draw it. In your house. You have your line, the line, and your neutral. This is L1, L2, and this is what's coming down into your panel. L1, L2, and the neutral bar. Right? This is what's in your panel in your house. Any any line to neutral is 120. So here to here is 120. Here to here is 120. And line to line is 240. Understood? So you have in your house, right? You say yes. Okay. You don't have a house. I do. You get it. Okay, so you got a panel downstairs. Yes. You got a panel in the garage someplace. It's got 240 and 120 in it, right? You don't know. Okay, not, not, not well, I'm telling you, it right? does. It <laughs> yeah. does. That's why I'm okay. here. This is what is over here. Residential services. This is what they look like. Three wires coming in, plus the, plus the stringer that connects it to the mass to, to the house with the hook. Okay? Three wires coming in. This is residential service. Good for light loads. Good for 120. Uh, that's about all I can say. It, uh, it has its purpose. There's millions and millions of homes that have that in there. Okay? Now we get over here. Uh, typical three wire also is split phase. I didn't, I, I should explain that. Uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into split phase when we talk about three phase. Three phase is where the schools are. The schools have three phase power because they need a little more oomph. They, they have a lot more load. They can't just run it on 120. It's too much load. They have to run the voltage up. They have to going to three phase. We have two types of three phase. The ones you're going to be familiar with is the Y, not the delta. But I'm going to show you the delta just to show you the difference. Now, I'll show you the uh, three phase. And this is what you're going to have in your schools. So what, where have you seen this? Fuses out of the street. OK. Where have you seen this? The flux capacitor. The flux capacitor. Excellent. <laughs> There's no such thing as a flux capacitor, but you are correct. This is the flux capacitor. This is called a Y, W-Y-E. This is what your schools, most of the schools I've ever, ever been in on Long Island have a Y. Okay? It's L1, L2, L3. This is neutral. Okay? So any L to neutral is 120. Any one of these. Here or here. Any L to L is 208. Okay? This is what your schools have in the car is and this is 90% of the schools have this wiring system in them. Are you familiar with these at all? Very little. Very little. Okay. Well, I wanted to show it to you today. When you're hooking up an air conditioner in a classroom because the kid needs a he's got a 504 or he's got an IEP and he's an air conditioner, this is what you need. You need that out of your pan. Right? Um, but this is how the school is wired, the big wires in the school. Now the delta 
The delta is more industry, as I put up there. Industrial applications is large, large factories, machinery, production. Delta looks, this is the Y, these are the windings in the transformer. The delta looks like this. Okay, so here's your L1, here's your L2, and here's your L3. Notice there is no common point. And that's the magic of all this. This is three phase delta for machinery. This is your three phase light loads, but you can pick up, with the new tool, you can pick up all the 120 loads. So that panel in the car has three hot legs in the neutral in it and 40, 50 circuit breakers in it. But it's picking up power this way. Delta, again, you're not going to run into delta unless you get into manufacturing or heavy machinery, uh, the factories and things like that. And for them to get neutral, they have to take this, convert this to a transformer, and get neutral. This is a little more expensive. But these are the two types of three phase power you're going to see more commonly. Questions? You don't get this at residential. They don't, residential, they don't give three phase power to. You know, it's a little more complicated, it's a lot more wiring. Uh, but because residential is split phase, and we're going to go back to that. I skipped yeah. over it, but I'm going to go back to it. Go ahead. So we have three lines coming into the building. Yes. All right, that's line one, line two, line three. Right, well, this is, this is the transformer hookup. You're going to have actually four neutral. Okay, so four lines are coming in. That's neutral yeah. is a line that comes in. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. neutral is a current carrying wire. We're going we're gonna to go through that. We're going we're to show you what a neutral is. Uh, neutral is one of the most misunderstood wires on the planet, bar none. Neutral is the most misunderstood wire. It's a complicated thing, but okay. yeah. Yep. So see, all right. So go ahead. So neutral is also, what is, what's the neutral tool? Is it send back? We're going to do it. We'll, hold that question. We're going to get into that one. We're going we're 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 to get there. Okay. We're going to get there. Okay? For right now, I just wanted to explain some of the systems that are out there. This is your school power. This is your industrial power. Okay. Not that you need to know that, but just so you understand that there's a reason for each. Heavy, heavy loads, because uh, this has a higher power factor. This has a lower power factor. It's neutral because what happens is it drops the voltage to 208. Normally, these voltages between phases are 240. Uh, here, it's 208 because of this neutral. Okay, but that's you don't need to know. You don't need to memorize that. You just need to know that's what's happening. Okay, what was I going to show you? I was going to show you split phase. Okay, let me show you split phase because a lot of people get confused with residential by calling it two-phase, and it's not two-phase. There is such a thing as two-phase, and it's not very common in this country. I have never seen it. I've only read about it in electrical books. There is a true two-phase. Going back to the sine wave, just for a minute, the three-phase sine wave. The three-phase sine wave looks like this. Here's the one phase. The other phase looks like this. The other phase looks like this. So it's three. It's three. It's three simultaneously running at 60 cycles a second. So you can see how much more power you get than just one. Okay? Three phase. A lot more power right there than one. Split phase, and people call residential two phase, and it's not. It's not two phase. It's a weird arrangement. Split phase is this. In other words, they actually take the same phase and split it into two. If you notice the other one, this was over here. You know what I mean? This one, they're actually splitting this phase into two pieces. And that's how you get the 240, L1 and L2. Not that you need to know that, but, uh, but don't, in residential people call it two phase. It's not two phase. There's three phase, two phase, and split phase. This is residential. This is what you have in your house. Very weird kind of an arrangement. Because if you notice, on the poles out front in your house, most of the time in the residential area, there's only one wire up there. Two phase would have to have two. There's only one wire going to the transform, and the other one is neutral and is directly into the ground. So let's get into troubleshooting. <clears throat> Big area. I'm going to check for voltage, use of meters, volt ohm, and amp probe, and I didn't bring an amp probe today, continuity tests. Okay, troubleshooting, number one. When you are troubleshooting a circuit, 
you want to make sure that your reference point, if you're going to touch it, is grounded. Why do I say that? If you're going to humanly touch an, an electrical circuit, whether it be a wire, a clip, anything, you want to make sure it's dead. You can't see electricity. You have to test it with a meter. You want to make sure that your reference point is always the earth. Why do I want to make sure the reference point is always the earth when you're testing something you're going to touch? Why would you think I'd want the reference point to be earth? Because that's what you stand on. You're standing on the earth. The earth, the big ball, can accept every ounce of electrical power produced on it. It can absorb it all. Lightning, power plants, anything. It can absorb it all. And if it has to go through you to get there, it will. And it will kill you in the process. Okay? Let's go over that again. When you are going to touch an electrical circuit, whether it be these wires or a contactor or anything that you're going to touch that you want to make sure is not energized, you are going to reference it to the earth because that's what you're standing on. Very important concept. I think you might reference it. Okay, I'm going to show you. Back over to the morning. I absolutely use the board. Okay. <clears throat> we have a circuit. Here's a light. Here's a switch, and here's the neutral. Okay? Here's the line, here's the switch. Right? Just one of these. Just, just a regular toggle, right? This is how it looks back in the diagram. This is the light. Okay. This is the hot, and this is the neutral. Now, the light doesn't work. We close the switch, and the light doesn't work. Uh-oh, we got a problem here. We've got to test this thing. Okay? Now, to test the light. To see if the circuit is good, we would put the voltmeter here and here. Okay? If we get a voltage reading, if we get a voltage reading of 120 here, what's the problem? The bulb. The bulb. This, this is not making a connection here. The bulb is on Perfect, right? Now, if we have a broken wire here, we have to touch this wire. Do we want to, before we touch it, we want to make sure that this wire is dead. Let's just say the switch is closed. Let's say that sometimes what happens with these is they lock. They, you think they're open, you can't see it, it's inside. You open it, but you didn't really know if it made you disconnect, do you? You really don't know. Right. Okay? So, here's the ground. We already know that if we take because the neutral in your panel is grounded, we already know if we take the voltmeter from here to the ground, we're going to get 120 volts, right? Hot to ground, we're going to get 120 volts. I'm going to show that to you, but we're going to get it, trust me. So if you are this voltmeter, you're going to get 120 volts if you touch this and you're standing on the ground. So if you want to touch this wire, you want to put your voltmeter here, and you want to test it to ground. If from here to here reads zero, then this wire must be dead. You're standing on the reference point. Your feet, here's where you are right here. You're standing on the ground. You're standing on the same reference point as your test. Therefore, pretty safe bet, this wire is dead. Do you understand that? Because if you don't, we'll go over it again. Okay? If you're testing to see if the bulb is no good, you'd want to test it to the other wire. But that doesn't help you touching it. When you want to touch something, you want to reference your point to ground. Now, as you get better at electricity, you may not have to do that. But I'm telling you, for this class today, at your skill level, your reference point is the earth. Okay? I'm going to show you that. We'll hook this thing up and I'll show it to you, all right? Let's, uh, let's hook this thing up. Let's put some power to this. I have a bunch of things here we're going to demonstrate. That's just a neutral way. Okay, this, this, and the light comes on. Okay. So, 
<clears throat> For demonstration purposes, this is the earth, this piece of steel. Would you agree? It's connected to ground, and the ground is plugged in. What happens if there is no ground? Well, that's, then you've got a problem. But you're still standing on the ground. You right. need to make sure that you... So you're ground. Yeah, you, yeah. You're going to need to make sure your reference point is ground. This I happen to know is ground. Right. Okay? So, if I touch this to neutral, well, just to show you this works. Oh, can't do that. Can't do that. Okay. Um, oh, here. Okay. Just to show you. Just to show you that that works. When we see that light on, you see that red light? Mm -hmm. That's 120 volts. Okay? We'll have to agree that every time you see that light on, it's 120 volts. Trust me, it is. Okay, so. <clears throat> so, we have the light, it's plugged in, the receptacle here, everything's good, right? Now, I'm going to unplug it for a second. I'm going to disconnect the neutral. We have a broken neutral in the line. Now, the light's not going to work. Am I right? No, the light's not going to work. We have no power there. Do this, light comes on, right? This one. So where am I getting the... Uh, Seems the ground. There we go. Oh, that disconnected somehow. Okay. Okay. Right there. Right there. I got power right there, right? You would agree? Mm -hmm. You would agree that if I touch that wire, I'm going to get it. Right. I'm going to get it. Okay, but it's the neutral. How is that possible? How is that possible? This is a neutral. How is it hot? Let me show you something. What's going to happen here? Not going to get it. Not going to get it, right? Because it's not coming back. It's not coming back. Okay. So you understand that? So you understand the reference point. You want the reference point to be the Earth. A neutral is a grounded wire. A neutral is a grounded wire in the system. Okay. Well, they're usually ground. They're in the box, aren't they? Usually yeah. Connected together. They're connected to Earth. But I just showed you a white wire that was high. Didn't I? It did. Yep. It happens all the time. All the time. That's called backfeeding. So when you want to touch that white wire, at your skill level. And usually there's uh, more of a zap too. Sometimes well, more. the zap is going to be how much power that bulb is going to deliver. That's going to be the zap. It's the weak link in the system. Okay? We understand this. You got this now? You look like you're going to well, I'll go over this again. Follow what's going on over okay. here. Okay, all right. You want to follow what's going on over here. Okay, yeah. plug it in. Yep. All I did was interrupt the white wire here. See what I did there? Okay. I just cut the white wire. Yep. When I connect them, the light comes on. Okay? Sure. But if I disconnect that, it goes off. Now, I didn't disconnect the hot wire. The hot wire is the black. Yeah. Okay? I disconnected the neutral and the light wire. But one of those neutrals now is hot. One of those neutrals has got power on it. Right? You connect the circuit. Complete the circuit. Right? Well, because, because it, the power is going down to black, going right through that filament, coming back on white, and getting right here, the right light in that bulb right there. Yeah. Okay? So if you are testing this circuit, let's go back to that diagram. If you want to test to see if the light bulb is no good, you put the voltmeter around the light bulb. Okay? Go back over here again. You following this? Here's the light. You want to test here to here, and he got the right answer. He said, "Well, dude, if you got 120 volts here, the light bulb is no good." Makes sense, right? Yeah. But if you want to touch this wire, if you want to touch it, you better be referencing the ground. And when I reference the ground, which is what this wire is, ground. This is the earth. I'm standing on this 
I'm standing on the earth. This wire represents me standing on the earth. Okay? The other black wire is what's connected to this probe. Okay, so I'm getting 120 volts on neutral. Okay. Yeah. Let me, okay. Okay. Let me let me, let me, let me show you one of those. I'm not thinking too far into this. Okay. No, 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 no. Let me show you. Maybe, maybe this will clear it up. Okay. We got the light working again. You know that if this light is light lit, it's 120 volts, right? What happens if I do this? How come I'm not getting the light lit there? So where is that going? The red. This here? Yeah. Is this black wire? It's this. It's this black wire. Oh, okay. It's to my test wire. It's, it's to this lamp. Okay. Okay. Yep. I'm not getting it here. Why am I not getting it there? Because the circuit's complete. Neutral's connected to the earth. Neutral's already connected to the earth. The potential from earth to earth. If I take a voltmeter, when this light bulb is on, if I take a voltmeter from here to here, my voltage is zero. It's only when I open this which is what I did with those alligator clips that you see. I opened that. Right? I opened this. Okay? I put an alligator clip here. I put an alligator clip here. Now, here is it's alive. Here it's still connected to the earth. It's only when I connect the two together, the light comes on and the voltage drops to zero. You understand? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Listen. That's why you're here. Yeah. To get a little background here. But what I want you to take away from this is this concept. When you test something you're going to touch, you want to test everything to ground. You want to test everything to the ground wire. A ground. A piece of steel. A ground okay. wire. Anything. But not to, its, not to the circuit. You don't want to test it to the circuit. Because that's only going to tell you if the circuit's got a problem with the circuit. But it's not going to tell you if it's live or dead. Because you're going to get false readings if it's neutral. Like I just showed you. I'm going to go over that again. This is the alligator clips that I'm, ha I'm have right here. Okay? I got no power here. Okay? I got power now. If I do this, that goes out, that comes on. I, I think the hard part is the fact that. You're saying that once you once that's disconnected, it's going to back feed, and you're going to get something on a neutral. But normally, when you work with a neutral, there is no right. But I still don't want you touching it. Right. I don't want you touching it. I still don't use a part because normally, if you touch it, uh, just a, a neutral, you're not going to get. That's right because mm -hmm. the neutral is grounded, and the it's voltage back, is zero. Why is it going back down? Okay. Earth to earth is zero. That's right. Yeah. You're right about that, but I'm trying to show that. Just be careful when you touch it. A neutral it. is the most misunderstood right. wire on the planet. Right. And people get in trouble all the time with these things. And this is the reason why. I didn't invent this system. You've got one loose neutral and you, you don't have anything. That's right. You're doing here. That's right, but you have live wires. Yeah. You have live wires all the way through that vault, or a motor, or a toaster, or anything that's plugged in. Right. Okay? Uh, let's go over this again. Uh, and I'm going to show you one other thing. Here we have. Um, we got, we got voltage here, right? Now, watch what happens when I unplug this. Watch that. Okay? You following what's going on here? I don't. Okay, I'm okay, not, that's I don't good. I understand what's going on over here. All right, all right, all right. Okay, well, let's start over again. So I want you to get this concept because this is why you're here. I plugged in the light, and all I did was open up the neutral here. That's all I did was I just separated the neutral. Okay. Yep. Normally when they're connected, the neutral's connected, everything's fine. Everything's Close fine, the light works. Okay? That's the light works. Circuit. No problem. We're going to plug the bulb, the light goes out, right? No problem. But we have a broken neutral. And where, where do we get broken neutrals? We get broken neutrals in junction boxes. So loose wire, the wire that falls off, whatever. Or underground in a concrete floor in the classroom, they rot out. And the wire, let's go. I've seen it a hundred times. So we have a broken neutral. Now, obviously, the light goes out. Power's still on. You get that part. Power's still on. Black. It's yeah. going through this. It's going through this black wire. 
It's going all the way through this thing, through the filament of the bulb. Now it's coming back on the white wire, and it's ending up right there. You got that? Yeah. You understand? If you, if you touch that right now with your hand. This right, right here? Yeah. I'm, what I'm saying is, anytime you see that light on, I'm getting electrocuted. But if I touch that white wire with my hand, what do I got? 120 volts. Now, if I touch this wire, what do I got? Nothing. Okay, yeah. Why? It's not connected. Yeah. You got that? Okay, so yes, yeah, so you, yeah. Okay. you got that so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so this is the circuit as it normally is. This is a broken neutral. So you're going to come along and test it, touch it with your hands. I've got nothing there. I can touch that one. Oh, ooh, I got I ain't touching that one. But my reference point because you may steal. Uh, if you touch it with your hand, the white. This one. Part. If you touch it with your hand, then this one right here. Yeah. I get blasted. Yeah. Could you make? The because it's going to go through me yeah. to the earth. Yeah. Which is the same thing that this is doing. Yeah. Through so this okay. to this. Okay. The important thing I want you to take away from this demonstration is the reference point to earth when you have to touch the stuff. That's, when you walk out that door, that's what I want you to remember today. You don't have to worry about what a Y looks like or a delta. I just gave you that for me. But this, I want you to remember. You don't want to be that reference point. So. You're right. I don't, want, I don't want this going through you to get to the earth. Yeah. Because the earth can take anything you give it, and it will kill you to get there. Sure. Electricity has no, it's like the virus, there's no, it doesn't matter. So now, if, if you were testing something, there was no ground hooked, hooked up, where would you now? Well, how can there not be a ground? You've got to be around a piece of steel. Yeah. You've got to be around it's anything. anything. Yeah. yeah, you know, the, the, the boxes that are in commercial work are usually made out of Now, they're outside, technically. Couldn't you think that? Would it into Absolutely. Ground and would it Absolutely. Okay. So Absolutely. Because ground. the earth, as long as it's a good connection, a ground rod or a mm -hmm. piece of steel in the earth, absolute. Because you're standing on it, and right. you can get electrocuted. A bird sits on the high voltage wire outside. A bird sits on it. What's his reference point? Just uh, on one wire. Yeah. Thing? Yeah. Bird. You see birds on wires? Yeah. How come they don't die? They're alive. They're not connected to the ground. Right? They don't have any reference. No. Yeah. They're not referenced to ground. A squirrel is on a pole, and I've seen it more than once. A squirrel standing on a pole, reaches up to go on the wire. Now. That pole is directly into the ground. It's got a reference point. Mm -hmm. Bang! It's the end of the squirrel. <clears throat> okay, but if a bird just lands on the wire, it's got a reference point. That's how they fix high voltage wires out there with a helicopter. They don't turn the power off. 345,000 volts and put out two states of power to fix an insulator that broke. They go to a helicopter and they don't have a reference point. The earth is way down there. That's how they do it. You, know, you see those guys with the rods and the, the, the suits they wear, the metal suits? And, uh, they, that's how they fix they high voltage lines helicopter. with a helicopter. I never saw that. Yeah, well, they do it. That's how they do it. They work from a helicopter? Yep. They, they lower them down, down from a helicopter. I think that would be safe. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can't get near those, tower, those towers. Um, you know, the towers are connected to the earth. Right. They can't touch that tower, and that's the end of them. That would be the end of the helicopter, too, by the way. But those wires are not connected to the to, uh, towers? No, they're connected with insulators. They got those gigantic things you see hanging off the towers. Those things that look like yeah. pine cones. Those are insulators, okay. so that the towers are just holding the wires up off the ground. Right? The break. <laughs> yeah, well, but they do have to change the insulators. They have to clean them sometimes. Whatever. You understand this concept? Yep. Sure. Yep. So go over it again. Neutral. Most misunderstood wire on the planet. Sometimes it's sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's not. Let me erase this. Because we're gonna go, we're gonna draw another diagram later. So uh, the reference point is always the earth. If you're gonna touch it, it's always the circuit if you're gonna troubleshoot it. You're not testing this. You're testing it. Okay? Okay, use of meters, volt ohm meter. Okay, I kind of use this as the volt ohm meter, but this is a volt ohm meter. Simple devices. Uh, voltage AC DC <coughs> and it has continuity. We'll go over the continuity. Uh, 
I touch the two, this is for continuity test. You hear the beep? So if you wanted to test to make sure that something is good, you know, here it's not going to go, things like that. Continuity. Fuses. So if you had a fuse, you were checking a fuse. Pull it out before you test it. You make sure that it's dead. You have a fuse, right? It's a 5 amp fuse, whatever. You put your meter here, put your meter here. You hear that, or you hear oh, you your own meter, OHM, your own meter, which is what that is set on. If you get a reading, the fuse is good. If you don't get a reading, the fuse must be open. The fuse is blown. You can't see inside the fuse. It's in power or whatever it is. The link, there's a link in here, but to test fuses, you would use that. De-energized. Out of the fuse holder. You cannot do that, what I just did. Energized. You got it? Mm -hmm. You do that energized, that's the end of your meter. It'll be in pieces. Okay. Um, Probe. I didn't bring an amp probe. An amp probe is uh, what, what, it, what an amp probe does is it checks the electrical field around around the wire. Let's take that diagram again with the light. Neutral line. If we clamp an amp probe, it's a coil of wire that goes around the wire, clamps over it, and it reads the field that's around the wire. There's always a field around the wire, and it reads it. So if this is uh, one amp, it will read one amp on the meter. This will be one amp, and there will be one amp here too, because it will be one amp all the way through the whole circuit. Okay, and we'll get into that. We're going to we're going to get into other diagrams like this to answer your question with the neutrals and everything. But an amp probe doesn't touch the wire; it goes around the wire, and it will read the current that's in the wire. Can't see it, but it will read it. It's there. Okay, switches and receptacles. Here we go. Brought some here. Uh, this is a Three-way switch. This is a single pole switch. Obviously, this is a receptacle. Can you tell me? Take a look at this and tell me what you notice about a three-way switch. One different terminal. One color different terminal. Mm, interesting. You know why? Yeah, usually, is that the, the common? That's the common. And then it's two travelers. Travelers. That's right. Take a look at that. You see how that one terminal is a different color? I mean, it means something. It means something. Okay? Single pulse switches don't have it. Two terminals are the same color. Which means you can put the wire on either one. It doesn't matter. It's just open and close. On and off. Okay? The only thing about these is they're marked top. If you put them in upside down, down is on, up is off. That's why they mark these top. That's not marked top. Because that makes no difference. It's a three-way. One's up and one's down all the time. Got that, right? Where have you seen three-ways? In your house, yeah, well, schools, everywhere. Okay. How does this really work? You want to draw it out? I'll show it to you. <coughs> Here we go.
Okay, that different color terminal is this one. And the same over here on this side, you need two. They call it a three-way switch and there's two switches. I didn't make this up, just the way it is, okay? A four-way switch has three-way switches. So I'll draw you a four-way. Three-way switch, right? So power goes in, goes through the travel. These two are called travelers. On the switch, which you see, you can put the travelers on either wire. It doesn't matter. They're not, they're not sensitive to which, which one goes where. Just as long as you hook up the travelers and not, this is the sensitive wire. This one, one of them has to be the feed. One has to be the feed to the device. Color terminal. Okay, you got that? So it goes in, goes through the traveler. Uh-oh. So you turn this switch over to here. And that will turn the light on. And the light will come on because neutral is always connected. Okay? So then either switch can break the circuit. Right? That's how that works. If you remember this diagram, you'll be able to wire a three-way switch. You'll never get confused in the field if you remember this simple little diagram. You might want to write that down. Three-way switch. Okay, four-way looks very similar. Only a four-way, what they did is, is two three-way switches and a four-way switch. <coughs> and a four-way switch is a switch that either connects this way or this way. That's how they draw it. So it'll either come in, go through the X, and go back up. Go through the X or come back up. So the one switch, which is a four-way, has to have four terminals. One, two, three, four. It's either this way or it's this way, where it crosses over. That's what a four-way is. Four-way switch. I have one. So four, four terms, but notice none of them are different because of the, they're in the traveler's circuit, okay? The sensitive wires are still on the ends on the three-ways. So to have a four-way switch, and you have them in your schools, I've seen a hundred of them. There's a four-way switch, you have to have two three-ways and a four-way. You can control light from three different locations. This one being this one, and then the two three-ways. You know, someone in school, they're using carvers, yeah. long carvers, they have four ways. Sometimes you don't even notice that they're there because one switch nobody ever uses, right. so it never changes position. You know, take a look at a four way switch. Four terminals. And there's an obvious, it says, well, it says this side up too. So. Yeah, well. So there's only one four way switch in the circuit. Yeah. And then it's your way set up. If you set up, it's a quarter in yeah. the middle, it'd be the four way, and the ends be. Yeah, well, the, the switches can be any place, you just have to wire it that way. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to change one in your house. Listen, we may have to change a three way in your house. Do you know how many times I've been called to somebody's house because they mixed up these wires? I can't get the combination right. And then all of a sudden, the light either doesn't work or it, it never turns off <laughs> because they mixed this wire. They didn't pay attention to that terminal. They didn't realize that that terminal was discolored for a reason. So they didn't take my class. That's the reason. They didn't know what a flux capacitor was. <laughs> Very good. Oh, the screws are one inch. Code of convenience. One inch long. The screws are one inch long. Is it code of convenience? Both. <laughs> he says both. What do you say? I say uh, convenience. You say convenience. You, and you kind of agree with him? Oh, wait a second. No, it's got to be code. It's code. One inch screws are code. One inch screws are code. Code says that screws have to be one inch. That's just the code. Uh, it's captive on one side here with a clip. Captive means the screw can't come out. Code of convenience. Code. Do you agree with it? Sure. Sure, yeah, because you don't know. Code. Code says it has to be captive on one side. Um, let's see what else here. They got the bridge tabs here. Right? You can break these tabs in the side and create two circuits in this, right? You ever done that before? No. We're going to go over that. Um, what else? What else do I have here? Um, conventional outlets. Okay. Um, yeah, that's also important to know, too, when you're testing. If you test one terminal, 
and that bridge is not there, the thermal could still be. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But again, that's during your circuit testing. Touching it, you're going to test everything. Right. You guys are going to test all these terminals before you go grab this thing. Okay? Because you could be grabbing the neutral and still get right. blasted here. Okay? Careful. Neutral is the most misunderstood wire on the planet. <coughs> so here we go. Um, the uh, paint. Paint on this thing. Are you supposed to paint this? Absolutely not. Take a look at this. Take a look at that. This was stuff that I took apart. I couldn't get it apart. Completely blue. Completely painted in. If your painters are doing that, shoot them. Ask questions later. Do not paint the faces of the receptacles. Take the covers off. Take the covers off. This is ridiculous. Every freaking thing he's going to do. Every receptacle in his house looked like this. I had to change every one of them. Okay? Do not paint the face. Because this is dielectric. This plastic is dielectric, it means it's an insulator. When you paint it, it destroys the dielectric quality, just like this fire door. If we put, it might be rated for 90 minutes, but not if you put combustible paper on it. It's no longer rated for 90 minutes when you paint it. Put paint on there, it will ruin the door. The door is rated the way it's built. These are rated the way they're built. Don't paint them. Okay? They're ugly. You can get one, get white ones. Sell them white, sell them gray, sell them black. Buy new ones. Any questions? Any, you guys have any questions about these things? A lot of code on these things. Lots of code. If you are working, I would suggest you do a ground. If you take, you're going to change one in the school, you got a metal box, put a ground wire. Tap the back of the box, put the screw in the back of the box, bring a little ground wire out, and attach it to this. It's much safer. Much safer. So the kids, they sit there, and they kick them, and they poke stuff in them, and oh boy, it's a mess. Try to ground these things anytime you get a chance. You know, a lot of the schools, like I said, they don't have grounds. Okay, let's see what we got here. Move along here. We are, okay, most common mistakes. We started to go over that. Um, Rearrange circuits and panels. Edison circuits. Big topic. I'm going to spend a few minutes on that. Edison was a smart guy. He only got one thing wrong. He wanted to go DC. It's the only thing he got wrong. Edison circuit. Let's say we have, let's start with this. Uh, hot, neutral, let's say this is 1200 watts doing this for ease of math. Okay, there's my load, 1,200 watts. What do we see plugged into a school corridor that's 1,200 watts? A corridor? Yeah. Hmm, how about the PTA in their coffee pots? Huh? 1,200 watt coffee pot. Okay, let's do some math. I'm going to do it, we're going to tie it into an Edison circuit. This is 120 volts. Our formula is V times A equals W, 1,200 volts is 120X. I know you did this in high school because I did. It's an aquatic equation. You divide both sides by the same number, you get X equals 10. All right? 10 amps. This coffee pot now is 10 amps. Current. Amperage. 10 amps. Watch. 10 amps. 10 amps. Well, this is usually a 20 amp circuit, so we're pretty good, right? One coffee pot, no problem. We'll make all the coffee they can drink and they'll be happy. Okay? And then they come along and they plug another one in. Okay, now what do we got? How much watts do we have now? 2400. 2400 watts. 120 volts. Do the math. What do we come up with here? 20. What's going to happen to the breaker? We trip it. Don't we see that all the time? Don't we see that all the time with these fry pans and these coffee pots when the teachers come in and they do all this stuff and the parents come in and they blow everything? Well, Edison had a solution for that. He said, what if we do this? What if we do this? He's a smart guy. He's as good looking as I am. What if we do this? We put another line here. This is 120, and he's 
can reach 1,200 watts. And your schools are full of this. And so are houses. I've seen them in houses too, kitchens. Now we have a duplex, which is what this is called, right? We <coughs> have a duplex. We have one here and one here. We plug one coffee pot into this one, and we plug one coffee pot into this one. First diagram, we're going to blow it because they were connected together. But if we break the tab on the hot side on this and put two lines to it and share the neutral, which is what we're doing here, we're sharing the neutral. We've got a 1200 load, 1200 here, on neutral current because of the split phase, the split phase, one's high, one's low. So if this is 10 amps and this is 10 amps, which is what they are, right? We already did the math, V times A equals W, we know that 1200 watts at 120 volts is 10 amps. Our neutral current is zero because they cancel out each other because they're opposite. One's high, one's low all the time. We can plug two coffee pots into that duplex, and it's only 10 amps. You're looking at me. You got this? Trying. This is in your car race. I've seen this a hundred times in school car race because they beefed up the circuitry in the car race for the power for the uh, burnishing machines, for the floor scrubbers, for the, for the vacuum suck, uh, the sucker machines, and all the other stuff that they plug into the car race. High voltage. I mean, high current use. They do this all the time. This is a great little thing. This is called an Edison circuit. This was invented in the 30s. They use three wires, and they get two circuits. Normally, you would have how many wires for two circuits? Two. Four. For two circuits. Oh, for two circuits, yes. Four. The it's problem is, sure. the problem is, this has to be hooked to this, and this one has to be hooked here. One has to be high, one has to be low. If these were both the same phase, what would the current be? Uh, 20 amps. 20, 20 amps, 2400 watts, you're right. You following that? I might have lost you on that. Okay, so you got your panel, you got your panel, you got, your, you got a two pole breaker here, and you're feeding a card receptacle with a neutral, here's the neutral, you're feeding your card receptacle. One's going here, one's going here. And your neutral, going over here. Okay, so you can get two circuits out of this thing. 2400 watts, when you, normally you couldn't if you left that bridge in. So you break the bridge, put two circuits there, leave the neutral alone. This is what you got. Follow that? It's, this is in your schools. You're going to see this in your schools. You better be careful because these two wires are out of phase. You hook these together, boom. Just like 208. This is 208, by the way, from here to here. You know it's 208. To each, they act individually? Yeah. yeah. Well, don't forget, you're breaking this tab. You see this little tab here? Yeah. yeah. You're breaking that tab. Yeah. So that one terminal is the top and one terminal is the bottom. The neutral, we're leaving alone because we only have one neutral. Can't get twice as much. Yes. Yeah. And this is in your schools. I've seen this a hundred times. These circuits are very common in industrial applications, schools, factories, because they can get a lot of power with just three wires. That saves them. You talk about the Empire State Building, they can save one wire in the Empire State Building. It's a lot of wire. It's a lot of copper. This was very handy. This was an excellent. So why do they have the bridge then? So they can break it. So, they, so lots of times you only have two wires. You would feed just one, one wire to here, and that's covering both top right. and bottom. Okay, yeah. yeah, it gives you the option. It gives you options. Okay? Okay. But here's the problem. Here's the problem, most common mistakes. Here's what happens. Go back to this now. I'm going back to this panel. The code says you're required to do a circuit like this. You have to use a two pole breaker so that when you turn it off, both go off at the same time. Both of these go dead. Here's what happens somebody needs an air conditioner in a classroom. They open up the panel and say, oh, there's a two-pole breaker there. Oh, it's just feeding 120 volts. We'll take these two wires off this breaker, and we'll put them on the same phase. We'll put them on the same phase. And we'll steal this two-pole breaker for the air conditioner. I've seen it a hundred times. I'm telling you, it happens. People that don't know what they're doing inside of a panel. So they take the two wires off, 
They put their air conditioner on there and they said, oh, I got it. Don't worry, boss, I got it. And they took these two wires, put them together, and put them on a single pole breaker. Now, this wire and this wire are on the same phase. Okay, so what happens to neutral current? Instead of being zero because 10 high, 10 low, 10 minus 10 equals zero, now the neutral current is 20. If these two are on the same phase, the neutral current is 20, you burn up the neutral. I've seen it a hundred times. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I've been in this business a long time. Most common mistake I've seen in the school is people rearrange the circuits in the panel without knowing a clue what they're doing. They were put in correctly when they were installed. The code requires them on a two-pole breaker. They needed a two-pole breaker because they didn't have one in the stock room. They said, here's one. Let's rearrange the panel. They never paid attention to the fact that these were on opposite phases because they didn't know what an innocent circuit was. They were wired correctly in there when the school was built. And then years later, everybody messed up the panels. I've seen it so many times. It's, I've, seen, I've seen these wires burn from over here. Okay, so most common mistake. That's one of them. Box grounds. Okay. Uh, I want you to. I'm going to leave this book. You can look at this. This book has. Uh, tells you how to put grounds. Let, let's go to neutral bonding. Let's go to neutral bonding and plastic covers. Okay. I'll, I'll get back to box grounds. Neutral bonding. We'll do this quick. I'm getting the. I'm getting the signal. Your house, your house, here's your house, your main panel in your house, here's your L1, L2, and your the earth, okay? Then you want a panel in your garage. So you say, ah, oh, I'm going to take a two-pole breaker, I'm going to go to my garage, and I'm going to put a panel in my garage. And then what do you do? You uh, put another ground rod out here. Uh-uh. Neutral is only required to be bonded the first panel. That's it. From then on, you have to run another wire out here for ground. Okay? You need to run another wire. You can only bond the neutral with the first panel. Another common mistake, I've seen it in sheds and stuff where they drive a ground rod out there. That's wrong. Because then you're, what you're going to do is you're going to interrupt the integrity of the circuit and everything's going to want to go to this ground. You, you, get, you get different ground paths, it's not good. The ground path here. What I'm trying to say is the neutral bonding in a residential service can only be at the first panel. Even in the school, it's like that. Down in the basement, it's only bonded to the water pipe once. In houses, it's bonded to the, it's bonded to the earth, and it's usually bonded to the copper water pipe. But only at the first panel. Never after that. Never after that. Meaning, let's go back to that every second, every second. Meaning, meaning that in the panel, this the neutral, and this is the ground, and the panel, they're connected together at the panel, here. Here, from this point on, they're never connected again. I have no continuity between this and this. They're never connected again after they leave the main panel, neutral and ground. That's an important concept. You might not understand it. Neutral and ground are never, so don't expect the ground to do the ground, the neutral to do the ground's job. It's not going to do it. From here on, they're separate circuits, separate wires. Ground is ground, neutral is neutral. Never mix them up. Don't use the neutral as a ground. It's not. It's part of the circuit. It's part of the circuit. Ground is never part of the circuit. Green wire is never part of the circuit. It's only there to hold on long enough to trip the breaker. That's all it's there for. It'll upset that current to trip the breaker. Okay. Metal and plastic covers. Can you use a metal cover on a plastic box? I get this question a lot. Can you use a metal cover at your house? Go to the Home Depot, you buy plastic covers, you buy metal covers, you got a plastic box. Can you use a metal cover on a plastic box? What do you say? I've never seen it. Never seen it. I have. Uh, wire mold in the schools. The wire mold is plastic and I see metal stainless steel covers on it, receptacles. I've seen it on these right here. You know that wire mold I'm talking about, that big stuff with the, the computer? And these things are in it, and I see stainless steel covers on it. Can you use a metal cover on a plastic box? What do you say? You don't know. What do you say? I'm going to say no. No. Do you agree with me? Yeah, but I, I don't know why. 
<laughs> you don't know why. Okay, we'll tell you why. Metal is a conductor. Do you want the metal cover to be energized on an insulator where you can touch it? No. Never use a metal cover on a plastic box. Never. Ever. You can use a plastic cover on a metal box because plastic is an insulator. Touch plastic, it's not gonna. Plastic isn't dielectric. Okay, we can touch the plastic. So this is live, we can touch it. Plastic covers are good for metal or plastic boxes. Metal covers are only for metal boxes. Because you don't want the face to somehow get energized on a place on a piece of plaster, which is an insulator. This could be sitting there energized, and you're touching it. Where's your reference point? Oh, that right there. Also and then if it's attached to a metal box, you ground it down. Right, well, if this thing is hanging off and it's energizing, you touch it, right. your reference point is right there. From here, through you, down here, okay? Never use a plastic. Metal on metal would be... Metal on metal is fine, be because good. once it becomes energized, it's gone. But it would be traveling through the, the metal yeah. it's attached to, not opposed to you. Yes, the metal will ground it. Yeah. In other words, if this, if this is attached to a metal box, and it becomes energized, it's going to trip the breaker. But if it's tied to a plastic box, I can take a live wire, put it right on a plastic box, it's not going to do anything. I can take a live wire, touch it to a plastic box, nothing's going to happen. Plastic is an insulator. Mm -hmm. But if I had a piece of metal in here, it could become energized. Metal is an insulator. Uh, How many times have you seen these things? Well, not too common anymore, but they used to be a lot. You know what this green wire? You know, do you know that you were supposed to connect the green wire to a ground? When you use these, how many times have you ever seen somebody connect that to a ground? These were always used wrong, incorrectly. They were changing the ground to an unground without connecting the ground wire. What the hell good was it? Most, most people on the planet didn't understand how to use this, which is sold in a grocery store. Another thing, you've seen these in your boiler rooms and all your stuff. These little holes here. Code of convenience. Code. Why? How many times have you seen the receptacle? You ground the receptacle. How many times have you seen the receptacle and the box separate from each other because all it was holding it was that screw? Right. Now they require you to put a nut and bolt right. through these, through those holes. That's code. These are code, these little holes. And inside this thing it has nuts and bolts. And that's what it's for. You'll see these. How many times in the boiler room have you seen it? You put a plug in and the receptacle falls inside the box. With that little tiny screw, let go. Mm -hmm. Code. Okay, more common mistakes. Metal and plastic covers, generators, back feed. Okay. Uh, I, I promise so. The overhead lines outside, here's the pole. Okay, and you're going. Okay, and there's tap to your house, and you have a panel. And they're hooked to the panel, right? <sighs> Simply, okay, and then you come along with a generator. And the power's out, and how many times have I said, well, I'll just plug it into the dryer outlet? Okay, right? Have you ever heard that? I'll plug it into the dryer outlet, and then it'll energize the house. Well, it works, because this has got, you know, a feed on it. It's got a box here. They take the generator, and they plug it right into here. Well, what's happening is, because this is dead, this is going straight through all the way up to here. Am I right? Okay, and there's usually a transformer hanging on here that's changing it from 13.2 to uh, 120. Okay, so it goes through the transformer and it energize, this generator will energize to 13,200 volts. And if you don't believe me, you're wrong. It will. That little generator you run in your backyard will go through that dryer receptacle, will go through the panel. We'll go up those wires out to the street, go through that transformer, and go back up on the grid. And then the guy working half a mile away gets hit. Don't do it. Somebody says, plug it into your dryer, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I've never heard of them. Oh, have you ever heard of it, Glenn? I have. Yes. Well, the worst part is if the power comes back on, now you have well, a nice little explosion. Huh? Yeah, but. But before that, have have some kind of a, a local switch. worker or a PCG will be hurt. Oh, yeah. Okay? Back feet. Back feet. You're required by code to put in a device to prevent back feet. <coughs> okay? 
Okay? And it's a very simple device. They're, not, they're expensive, but they're simple. And they look like this, just to give you an idea what they look like. It's a switch okay, that has uh, two other points in it. Let's see if I can throw this right. Uh, okay. When this switch is down, this switch is up. Okay, something like that. Okay, so that it's either energized from the street or it's energized from the generator, but it's never energized at both. Never. It's mechanically interlocked so that it can't happen. Okay. Don't plug it into your dryer. Help. How many times people are desperate? They have no power. They're hot. They're cold. They're this. They're that. They're in the dark for three days. They'll do anything. They'll do anything. I'm telling you. Don't do it. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. You'll kill somebody, or maybe yourself. Generators. We did the V times A equals single phase. Just for your reference point, the V times A, 1.73, that's three phase. That's the magic of three phase. Three phase picks up the current, current, by 1.73. That's why it gives you a lot more punch in that factory. V times A times 1.73 equals watts. Three phase. Okay? I know you had to do quadratic equations, whatever, you know, you just do the math. If you know the wattage, you can figure out the amperage. If you know the voltage, you need to know two out of the three all the time. It's just simple. This is math. Okay? V times A. The most common one you're going to run into is this one. V times A equals W. Period. Single phase. 120 volts. Or 240, single phase. Three phase is that. Three phase, okay? Now, air conditioner, room air conditioners are single phase. They're 208, but they're single phase. You understand that? The boiler motor, probably three phase, three hot wires, but the air conditioner is only two. It's split phase. It's not two phase, it's split phase. So the air conditioner in classroom is this formula, the boiler room, or some of the big, maybe the uh, big air handler, or uh, a chiller, I'm using this one. But you probably, you don't have to. You don't need to know that, just know that this is where the magic is on three phase. It's that uh, 1.73. Uh, ground fault or interrupters, big topic. I have one set up here for you. You see the green light is on. Okay? This is a line, okay? Question I get all the time Will a ground fault work with the ground wire disconnected? What do you say? No. No. What do you say? No. Ground fault will not work with the ground wire disconnected. Okay, let's, let's do some experiments. We already know that when you see that light on, 120 volts, right? Okay, so you see the light on? We're at 120 volts. We're not in the ground fault, okay? Okay, so we'll plug it in here. Ground wire is connected, am I right? See that? Ground wire is connected with my jumper here. Tripped. Ground wire connected. Okay, why did it trip? It tripped because this wasn't plugged into here. Remember how a ground fault works. Here's how a ground fault works. Here's the receptacle that I you just tripped, that I just tripped, okay? The ground fault inside this thing has a little coil around this wire and a little coil around this wire. And it's constantly looking at the current going this way and the current going this way, constantly, a million times a second. If the current is equal, it delivers power. So the minute it becomes unequal, it trips. That's how they work. That's how, that's, the long and the short of how a ground fault works. Okay? So what I did is I plugged this in and there was no neutral. There was the neutral. Okay? You follow that? Okay, here's the ground. So this this actually is the human. This is a human being right here. Okay? Let's reset this. Okay? Now if this wire was here, if I plugged the lamp in, obviously it would work, right? Because both would be plugged in, but I'm only taking the one. Trips right away. Because it was unequal. You got that, right? You understand that? Okay, so now let's disconnect. Disconnect, right? Will this ground fault work with the ground wire disconnected? We're going to find out. Okay, we know that the light works. Not, right? That's 120 volts. 
How is that? How is that possible? How did that work? Okay. In my diagram here, was the ground wire any part of this ground full circuit interrupter? Is there a ground wire here? No. No. Does it need a ground wire? Does it need a ground wire? Okay. That's how simple they are. This, okay, I would recommend you hook up a ground wire. Is that because it's still neutrals still originally hooked up at the ground at the uh... No. It's because it's because I plugged that probe here and I had it plugged to a ground. Right? Here was that here's my test light. Right? That's this. This is the probe. And that little white wire connected to steel is this. Okay, and all I did was hit the ground, hit the hot, and it dumped it. Why? Because it didn't see anything right here. It had nothing to do with the ground. It didn't see anything right there. It said, I'm done. Trip. And it dumped it. And you saw it. You understand that? But fix to a, the code says you can fix an ungrounded receptacle with a ground fault interrupter because it will still work. The fix to an ungrounded receptacle, if you want it to be grounded, is to install a GFI. It will work. I just showed it to you. And that's why. You got this? You remember this? That's what we did here, right? You must hook them up correctly. More times than not, I remember, people call me up and say they, they changed the receptacle in their bathroom and now it doesn't work. They mixed up all the wires. Then they forgot which one was the hot and which one was the feed going to the next receptacle and I had to figure it all out. And once you wire it correctly, it will work correctly. And there's different ways of, if you put two lines into a line, it, 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 it's protected that, but it won't protect what goes out to the next That's correct. If, That's you want, correct. if you want it to be protected down the line. Yes. Like in the kitchen. Yeah. Where you need in other words, this is on the line terminals, and then there's two other terminals here that say load. Only if you hook to load will the further receptacles be protected. Right. If you tap off of this, well, you're not going through the device. Right. Yes. That's correct. Like if you're in the kitchen, you only need one. Right. And after that, everything's protected. After that. Even though well, it's no, no. not that. But in a kitchen, if you're going to protect the downstream, you have to hook the next right. receptors to right. load. Right. right. So you don't necessarily need a second one over here because it's no. wide to Right, the, right. Yes. Sometimes that's inconvenient because then you don't know which one will happen. Right. You know, my wife is always like, oh, she blows it and all out. Now I don't know what. Happened. No power to an outlet, but somewhere on the other side of the house, it was actually wired to a, a GFI. That is, that is and true. And it was off. And that controlled an outlet on the other side of the house. Wall. And your schools must have these things in them. They gotta have these things. They're required. Yeah. You know, around water and all that stuff. They're required. Okay. But it's good, to have, it's good to know. It's good to have a little understanding of how they work. You know, they don't need a ground. They'll work. You hook them up right, and then and they're working. And, and they do go bad every once in a while, but they won't reset. They'll work, and they'll work good. They protect your life. And this is only to protect human life. This was not. Most of these code changes are not because they felt like changing the code. As a result of people getting hurt, people getting killed, people getting electrocuted, people getting burned. Okay? Proper wiring, how they work, uh, conductors, purposes, demonstration, we did. Arc fault breakers. I, I, I like to go over this. This is something that happened after I took my test. In bedrooms now you're required to have arc fault protectors. Uh, it prevents fires. Lots of fires happened in bedrooms, um, in sleeping areas where the stuff was arcing in the wall. They have devices now that you can buy that will sense that and turn the circuit off. They're required. Just know that they're out there and that's what they are. They're required by code in new construction. And not a bad idea if you wanted to redo your son's bedroom or your bedroom, put arc fault breakers in to protect the uh, circuits. And a lot of it is that you hear some sizzling in the wall, this will pick it up and turn it off. They're, 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 they're an uh, industry that's developed for safety just like this was 25, 30 years ago. You know, these were developed by the industry to help people. You know, these are too. Uh, don't discount these. These work. These work to prevent fires. So it's just a receptacle? Uh, it's actually a breaker. It's actually the feed breaker to the okay. bedroom. Okay. It's the breaker that, that uh, detects it. Uh, wiring practices. Demonstration of live nooses. We did that. Still a lot of water. Plugs, 120 volt receptacles, we kind of did that too. Wire nuts, I get this question all the time. Do I tape wire nuts? Do I have to tape them? I don't tape wire nuts, but
But what I do is with the wires, I twist them together. I don't just stick them in the wire and put the wire nut on. I twist the wires together first and then put the wire nut on. I generally don't tape them. I generally do not tape them. If you do the wire nut correctly, you don't need to tape it. It's perfectly the way it is. It's fine. I get that question a lot with wire nuts. And if you read the box, they'll tell you what size wires to use with what size wire nuts. The red ones, the yellow ones, the blue ones, the gray ones, whatever. Aluminum. I get a lot of questions on aluminum. Is there a cure for aluminum in housing? What's the answer? Is there what? Is there a cure for aluminum wiring in housing? Why they ever let it happen is beyond me. Uh, they got cheap and they said, oh, the price of copper is too high, we'll let aluminum in. It's the worst thing they ever did. They are so sorry that they ever allowed aluminum. Thousands and millions of houses were built with it, and they're sorry they are. Yeah. Well, pigtail? Yeah, Is there a cure for it? Is there a cure for a little wire in your house? The short answer is no. It's elimination. It's the only cure for it. They have tried all kinds of things. Penetrax, they've tried wire nuts, they've tried Buchanan splices. They tried a hundred different things, and none of them really worked that great. Pigtailing is about the best. The penetrax with the copper pigtails. These receptacles are usually uh, labeled copper or copper aluminum. You have to read the back of them. This one here says CU and copper clad wire only. If you read the back of this, it says copper or copper clad wire only. You can't put aluminum on this. The, the, this is not tested for aluminum. Most devices are like that. You read them, they'll tell you copper or copper only. Copper wire only. Not even copper clad. Copper clad is aluminum wire with a copper coating on it. Okay, that's what it's copper class. There is no cure for it. Why is it so bad? Why is it bad? It's the coefficient of expansion of aluminum. Copper, aluminum at low voltages, which is 120 volts, it expands and contracts so much on the load. You plug the coffee pot in, you take it out. You plug it in, you take it out. It keeps doing this all the time, and it loosens up the screws because it's high voltage, low current, maybe 10 amps. You know, the coefficient of expansion you plug a plug load in, what's the, what's the difference on the 345,000 volt line? Nothing. You know what I mean? Do the math. V times A equals W. Do the math. The more that V is, the less the A is. To get to the same W. Alright? That's the way the equations work. Okay? So, aluminum, I get a lot of, a lot of problems with aluminum. I get people calling me all the time and got aluminum troubles. The best way to get solve aluminum is the air regulator. National Electrical Code Handbook. Okay, here. Uh, this is the National Electrical Code Handbook. If you're serious about doing any kind of wiring, this is the book to get. Your district buys thousands of dollars worth of books a year. If you're serious about wiring, buy this book. It's about $200. I looked it up online. The new ones come, they come out every three years. I'll pass this out if you want. We we'll look at it. It's a great book. So, in summary, we've discussed electrical concepts and described electricity, including current, circuits, power. We've described basic troubleshooting techniques. We have avoided and correct common mistakes. We perform basic wiring safely, which means uh, how I told you how to use grounds, how I use, uh, you know, like solid wire goes around the screw. Try not to use the back. Go around the screw. It's a lot better. Um, and uh, we had some demonstrations on what can go wrong and what can go right. 